John chapter 7, verse 53, through John chapter 8, verse 11. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. We on? <clears throat> Good morning. You guys doing well? Everyone get enough sleep? Who need a little bit more sleep? Come on, you're at the 1045 service. This is late, people. Hope you're doing well. Uh, for those of you that may not know me, my name is Blake. I'm the high school pastor here, and I have been for just over a year. Um, yes, I got hired on full time a week before we shut down as a church. Imagine that. Trying to do ministry without being at church. It's possible. There have been so many good things that have happened within this past year, though, in my life. Um, I have been married for three and a half months now. Yeah. To my beautiful wife, Chantel, she is here, but I'm not going to point out because she will kill me later. So I will leave it at that. But she is amazing, a huge blessing from God. Uh, and she is way cooler than I am. I'm sure a lot of people here can attest to that. But yes, I am glad to be joining uh, you today. And I believe God is going to speak to us today. And um, many people here are going to leave changed. And I'm excited and thankful for that. Help me get to know you guys a little bit though, all right? How many of you, by show of hands, have ever made a mistake in your life? Okay, so we have some good people over here, not so good over here, no. Yes, we have all made mistakes in our life. Now, let me ask you this, how uncomfortable would it be if you stood up right now and the person next to you dragged you down to the front and started, started exposing all of your deepest mistakes? Anyone want that? What if I told you, it was, what if it was for your good? What if it was uh, for you to grow closer in your relationship with God? Would you want it then? Amen. Really? I think we have one honest answer over here. No? <laughs> no one wants to be publicly exposed like that. I had a moment similar to this when I was in high school, although I was not dragged anywhere. This is what happened. I was in a Spanish class, and uh, this is before I knew Jesus, and I wasn't the best student, I'll be honest. And so test day came around. I didn't study. And so naturally, what did I do? I wrote the answers on my hand. Many of you can see where this story is going. The test, uh, we were taking the test and I had my hand up like this while writing like this. I didn't think I was being obvious, but I was. And I had black ink too. Jeez. But I'm writing in the answers, and while everyone is taking the test, the teacher goes, Blake, come here. And so I walk over. I'm trying to scrub off the answers on my way up. 
at that moment, it's just best to fess up. Like she knows what's going on. And she goes, Blake, I know you're cheating. And so you can imagine every other person in this class knew what was going on. See, I was publicly exposed and humiliated in front of the entire class. It was for my good though, because guess what happened the next time test day came around? I studied. (laughs) Guess what everyone else made sure to do as well? Study or cheat and blame Blake. No, they studied as well. More of the story, don't cheat, just study, all right? It'll get you a lot further in life, especially all you young people. But I tell you this story because we are looking at a woman today who had been caught in the act of adultery, who had committed a sin and she was being exposed for it like Dustin had read. The hard part about this story, the difficulty is that she is being used as a tool to try and trap Jesus. And so she is being taken to a place that is less than human to try and trap Jesus because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would do anything to get rid of this person, Jesus. But before we get into that, let me pray over this message and we will hop right in. Pray with me. God, thank you for this morning. I thank you for every person that is here. Uh, Lord, speak to all of us in a unique way. You know exactly what is going on in our hearts. You know all the struggles we are going through. You know everything, God. And so we just place everything before you right now and say, have your way. Lord, speak through your servant this morning. Um, Get me out of the way. Let these be your words and let them be impactful so that people can leave here changed, drawing closer to you, Jesus. And we pray this in your beautiful, matchless name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. So as Dustin was reading uh, the scripture for this morning, I want to paint the scene a little bit more, okay? So Jesus is in the temple and all the people in the surrounding area, that's what scripture says, all the people gather around to hear what he had to say. So we can imagine that there are a lot of people in this place at this moment. Are you kind of there right now? This is one of those stories where you can really put yourself in it. That's why I love it so much. And so Jesus is here. People are gathered around him. And in come the hot shots. In come the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And they, but they didn't come alone. They came in with a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And again, she was being used as a tool to try and trap Jesus, as scripture says. And they use a Levitical law. They use the word of God to try and trap Jesus. I always find that funny, considering Jesus is the word. But they use this and they think, man, we got him this time. He's trapped, we got him. We get to go home, pack your bags. We're good to go. And this is what they say. This law comes out of Leviticus 20, verse 10. It says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Are there any questions coming to mind right now? A lot of you have already said it, but where in the world is the fella? Where in the world is the guy? Why is he not present in this moment? Did he not commit the same sin as this woman? He did. The reality is the Pharisees knew the law, but they completely disregarded it and dare I say manipulated it in order to try and trap Jesus because that was their true agenda. To get rid of Jesus. And here's the thing, when it came to adultery and when someone was publicly exposed for adultery, the entire crowd, everyone there would start to look for stones. It was a cultural norm. They would, they would go around, so we can imagine everyone there in this moment, they're starting to look for stones, ready to uh, throw them at this woman and, and put her to death. This was the cultural norm during this time. And so you can imagine there was probably a lot of emotion going on with uh, the crowd being 
amped up, ready to go, to the woman being scared out of her mind, I would imagine. I mean, her life is flashing before her eyes, not knowing what is going to happen next. And then we have Jesus who is completely calm. And this is what happens when they uh, try and confront Jesus, when they ask him the question of what do you say? That's what scripture says. If you wanna put it up there real fast. Or the next one. They were using this, uh, uh, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? What do you say, Jesus? Skip forward one. Oh, back. Just stoop down. That one. This was his response. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground. Instead of just giving an answer right away, instead of just saying the first thing that came to mind, because he already knew what the actual issue at hand was going on, he paused. He bent down and wrote on the ground. How many of us in here need to spend a little bit more time thinking before saying? Anyone? I usually say and then think, and then consequences follow. It's a reoccurring thing in my life. You would think I'd get it by now. A lot of us probably do that in this room, but Jesus pauses and he thinks of the real issue. He thinks, and it's good to think about real issues when they arise in our lives. Rather than just reacting right away, we respond by pausing. There's something to learn, be taught out of this. But he bends down. And during this time, the Pharisees and the crowd, they, uh, they keep on asking him, hey, when are you going to respond? When, the, when they kept on questioning him, they keep on asking him, hey, what's going on? And he responds by straightening up and he says to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Friends, the ultimate agenda of the Pharisees in this moment was to cancel out Jesus. And we are seeing similarities today with the cancel culture. See, cancel culture is not new. We see it taking place in this very story that they would do anything they could to cancel out Jesus. And he responds with this profound statement that says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And many of us are probably sitting back and going, holy smokes. We're going, you tell them, Jesus. You put them in their place. They thought they had you, but you actually have them. What many of us don't realize is that we are often the ones holding the stones. We are often the ones ready to throw them at someone who doesn't agree with us. Don't believe me? Just go on Facebook. We are so ready to pick up a stone and throw it at someone who doesn't have uh, the same political view as us. So ready. And it's that is not what God has called us to. God has called us to a deeper way of living. Not to throw stones, but to love someone who has different beliefs in us and come alongside them, not to cancel them out. See, we so often get ourselves in the same situations as the crowd does, where we are ready to cancel someone out of our lives if they don't believe the way that we believe. Have you been there? We've all been there. We've all done it. The hard part is recognizing that we have done it. Well, maybe even worse than that are the people who say they don't have any stones at all. We all have our own collection. And this collection needs to be brought before Jesus so he can take care of our own self-righteousness.
This is what's going on in this time. I am way further down now. The moment that we realize that we don't have the authority to pick up a stone and throw it at someone, we have a similar response as the crowd does. Who, as it says, began to go away one at a time. They begin to walk away one at a time when they realize, man, I am not the person in authority. They, sh- they drop their stones and they turn. Many of us in here, we need to realize our own judgmental patterns and we need to start dropping those before the throne room of God and turning away from that. But it says the older ones first. That's interesting. There's something to say about young people. Okay? I'd be considered one. I'm 26. Or at least I think I'm still young. I don't feel that way oftentimes, but... Anyway, young people have a harder time realizing their own sin. They have a harder time realizing their own pride. And so you can imagine in this moment, a lot of the young people were probably like, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm good. Not realizing their own pride takes a little bit longer for us sometimes. I had a a very humbling moment a couple years back I had just graduated Bible college and I left there thinking, man, I got this in the bag. I know my Bible, I know my stuff, I'm good to go. And so I started to use this as a way to almost put people down, as a way to show people how they aren't correct and how I am. I was in Idaho and Uh, Part of my family lives there. My grandpa, who is in his 80s now, do you guys know who Bob Ross is? He has the same hair as Bob Ross. (laughs) Just that white, poofy goodness. I just want to, I feel like it's a trampoline. Boing. Anyway. He's sitting in the backyard, a man who barely says 20 words in a day, extremely wise, probably the wisest man I know. I walk in the backyard and he goes, Blake, sit down. And I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. I've never had this moment before. And he looks at me and in my 26 years of living, I had never seen this man cry. And tears start to well up in his eyes. And he goes, Blake, no one cares how much you know. They only care how well you love them. No one cares how much you know. They only care how well you love them. I'm not saying knowledge is bad. But it is bad if that's our true pursuit. Our true pursuit should be Jesus and the love that he offers. That's our true pursuit. Everything else falls behind that. And so he said this to me and it hit me like a ton of bricks and I was completely humbled and I spent some time with God and I'm like, man, I myself am constantly throwing stones at people. I myself am constantly picking a stone up and, and going, oh, you don't agree with me? Here you go. I myself have gotten trapped into the idea of cancel culture. It was a very humbling moment for me and it was a moment where God met me in it and he meets all of us in those moments. And the reality is every single one of us will have moments like these in our walk with Christ where we will be the person throwing a stone or on the other side of it receiving it. It reminds me of the story of the prodigal son who runs away and then the older son After we say yes to Jesus, we so often become the older son. We so often forget to humble ourselves, to come before the throne room of God and realize, man, I was a prodigal son at one moment in my life. 
We get so self-righteous and it hits us to the core. Thanks be to God though that he meets us in it, truly. At this time, in this, uh, in this moment in the story, it's Jesus and the woman. After everyone had walked away, after all the hype is down, after all the emotions from people with their stones, after dropping them, and they're probably going, what just happened? This is new. It is down to just the woman who had been caught in the act of adultery in Jesus. And I can only imagine what she was feeling in this moment. Since from a legal standpoint, Jesus was the only one who could truly throw a stone because he was without sin. So what would he do? How would he respond to such an act that the woman had committed? This is the God that we serve. The God that we serve responds in this way. Jesus straightened up with a sense of authority and he asked her a question. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? I mean, that's incredible. We so often, I mean, when someone hurts us or harms us or does something wrong towards us, we are so ready to cancel them out. But look at Jesus, his response. He says, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Then neither do I condemn you. Friends, what is being displayed here is the core beliefs of this church, love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Jesus is inviting this woman in with all of her baggage. He's loving her so well. He's accepting her, not approving of what she is doing. There's a stark difference. Not approving of what, of what the crowd had done, because that's really a, a big issue as well, because the crowd, although they may have not done something on the exterior, there was some stuff going on on the interior that they weren't being honest about. So he's accepting, even the crowd, accepting this woman saying, go and leave your life of sin and follow me instead. And then he forgives. He says, where are they? Who has condemned you? And then follows up with, neither do I condemn you. For the person that may not have a relationship with Jesus, this is him. This is the God that we serve. One who is loving, one who is accepting, and one who is forgiving. One who is constantly inviting us into a deeper relationship with him. And my question to you, to that person, why aren't you responding to this great love? Have you walked away from it? Have you denied it completely? This is the God that we serve. A good and gracious God. I'm gonna invite the worship team up as we close. Friends, whether we are the one throwing a stone or on the other side of it, God will meet you there. He will meet you there. Let us learn to practice loving others and not canceling them out. Let us go against the cultural norm because the cultural norm nowadays is just to get rid of the person who doesn't agree with you. We are called to something deeper. We are called to swim upstream, not go downstream with the rest of everyone else. Let's walk away from the cultural norm. I'm gonna close with these four key points. Number one, we serve a gracious teacher who corrects us when we are living a self-righteous life. 
We saw that in the crowd. We saw their own self-righteousness. And it points to the fact that we have our own self-righteousness in our own lives. And thank God that he corrects us in those moments. That he doesn't allow us to go on our own way. But that he drives us back and humbles us. No one likes that process, but it's good for you. Number two, we serve a gracious teacher who meets us in our sin. You know that scripture says, while you are still sinning, Christ died for you. While you were still sinning, Christ died for you. You didn't have to clean up your stuff because truly you couldn't. You'll never get to a place of perfection. No, while you were still sinning, Jesus died for you. Number three, we serve a gracious teacher who accepts us even though we don't deserve it. We saw that beautifully displayed of what took place in this story about how he accepts us, doesn't approve of us. I don't want us to leave here thinking that he approves of everything we do, by no means. But he accepts us. Number four, we serve a gracious teacher who offers us a new way of living. He offers us a new way of living by saying, go now and leave your life of sin. Follow me instead. Follow me instead. Again, for the person who may not know the Lord, this is him. This is who he is. And I believe that he is speaking to your heart in this moment, saying, come to me. Turn away from this life that you've been living for so long. Come to me. The pinnacle moment of all this is a realization that Jesus took the place of the accuser and the accused. Jesus ultimately took the stoning for all of us on that cross where he died. He took the stoning for you. Don't forget that today. And let that be something that changes your lives and respond to that great love by saying, God, I'm all yours. That's what I did back in 2016, January of 2016. My life radically changed because I said, I'm all yours, Lord. I'm done living this life. Never thought in a million years I'd be up here. I still don't feel adequate, but God has his ways. Pray with me as we continue in a time of worship. Lord, thank you for today. Lord, for your word that corrects us, that loves us, that meets us, and that offers us a new way of living. Father, we give our lives to you. We give every breath to you. We say, have your way in our lives. We give up control, Lord, and we praise you. And all God's people said,